Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I feel like I should start this by saying this is the science bit, so it's time to concentrate. Um, I want to start by introducing you to a friend of mine. This is George, and George is the very first robot that I owned. Um, he was bought for me when I was about five years old by my parents. And when I was a child, I used to love trying to generate obstacle courses and getting George to navigate around them. So he has, little, he has a keypad on his head where I could program him in to go kind of forwards and backwards and turn left and right. But invariably, something would go wrong when George was navigating these obstacle courses. His wheels would slip or he'd get caught on the carpet. Or perhaps my brother would come in and pick him up and move him somewhere else. And so he'd end up failing in his challenge to navigate these obstacles. Now, it wasn't George's fault. It was my fault. As the designer, I'd programmed him to do a very specific task. But I hadn't been able to foresee that there would be challenges on the way and how he might be able to overcome those. Now, some years on, and I'm still playing with robots, but now I'm trying to work out ways we can build robots that can go beyond that initial programming to continuously learn new skills and new abilities that will allow them to overcome all kinds of different challenges. Now, robots that could do this could be deployed in a whole wide range of applications. But perhaps the most exciting and interesting are ones where the robots have to work alongside or with humans. Because we are very unpredictable beings. And robots that would work with us would need to be able to overcome all kinds of challenges that we wouldn't be able to design into their systems and pre-program them for. So here is an assistant robot. And here, it's making us a cup of tea. But for a robot to learn this type of task, it's got to overcome some really big challenges. And I want to talk about two of those today. The first challenge is how a robot like this can identify the relevant information for learning. If it's going to make a cup of tea and learn how to do that, it needs to know where the kettle is, how to work the kettle, how to pour liquids from one container into another, where the tea is. But it's also going to have a lot of other information at its disposal that is completely irrelevant to this task. For example, it might know what color the walls are, or how to mow the lawn, or it might even know how many yogurts there are in the fridge. But this information is completely irrelevant for the task of making tea. But the robot doesn't know this. It has to learn. And if it can't distinguish between the relevant and the irrelevant, it's going to spend hours, days, weeks, maybe even months, trying to work out whether a raspberry yogurt or a strawberry yogurt in the fridge results in a better cup of tea. Now, it sounds ridiculous, but this is the kind of problem that we face when programming robots. How do they understand these issues? The second challenge that I want to talk about is how robots identify tasks for learning and learning opportunities. They've got to be able to identify tasks that are achievable and that are relevant to the situations they're in or the situations they think they're going to be in in the future. For example, if the robot is making a cup of tea, it has to be able to operate the teapot, sorry, the kettle, and it has to be able to take the lid off of the teapot. If it can't do these things, it's going to fail to make tea. So it has to target its learning at the correct level. Now, as humans, we're very good at this kind of continuous learning and overcoming these kind of challenges. And in particular, we see that infants are very good at just the two things that I've mentioned. They're born into the world, and they're suddenly faced with a whole range of sensory information. And yet, somehow, they manage to make sense of that information. And they also are very good at directing their learning and learning actions and activities that are relevant to what they're doing, but that are also achievable. And so in our work, we've been looking at infants and trying to learn lessons from how they learn and develop so that we can program robots that are capable of this kind of continuous learning. So I've told you a little about, about the problem, and I've introduced you to my very first robot. Now I'd like you to meet my most recent robot. This is the iCub. Um, and if you haven't spotted, it's the one on the right. Okay? Um, this is a very advanced piece of kit, and it's built by the Italian Institute of Technology um, in Genoa. And it's remarkable. It has cameras for its eyes. It has microphones in its ears. It has 
tactile sensors on the palms of its hands and on its fingertips, so it can touch objects and feel the sensation of doing so. It's also got 54 powered joints, 54 motorized joints throughout its body. And on each of those joints, there's a positional encoder. So the robot can read off the angle of each of those joints. Now, a real challenge for a robot like this, and the first thing that we need it to learn, is how to control its body and how it will operate in the world, how to correspond the movements it makes with its arms, with what it can see with its vision. And it's very challenging for a robot like this because it might be able to move the joints in its arm and see that there is some blob that it can't recognize as a hand, but it might be able to recognize that there is this blob moving in its image. And it's got to correlate the movement of that blob with the motion it's making at the different joints in its arm. And that's quite difficult when it can move the arm in a whole range of different directions. But it's even more difficult when the other arm is going, or when a leg is going, or perhaps when the head is moving and looking around in all different directions. How does it know which joints are making what movements? Now, I say this is very difficult for a robot, but infants do this. Infants are very good at learning to control their bodies against this whole raft of information. And when we look at infants, we actually notice there are some really good tricks that are going on that perhaps help them to solve this kind of problem. See, infants, newborn infants, aren't as fully developed, quite clearly, but they are very limited in what they can do. Their brains are still growing and their bodies are still growing. And it turns out that their sensory systems are still developing, particularly vision, which is very coarse, so the newborn infant can't see with the same level of detail that we can as adults. It can't pick out fine details. But it can pick out large, bright objects, like perhaps a hand moving in front of the face. It's also restricted by the level of development of its body. It doesn't have enough muscle tone to be able to move its arms and its legs and its body against gravity. And so newborn infants mainly only move their eyes. And these constraints, as we call them, Rather than hindering the development and the learning of the infant, they actually help focus it on the activities that it needs to grow and survive. So the newborn infant will be mostly moving its eyes because of this constraint on its muscle tone. But because of the low resolution of what it can see through its eyes, it makes it very easy for it to correlate the movements that it makes with the eyes with what it can see. And so what we've done is we've tried to build into our robot this, these kinds of constraints that we see in infancy and see if we can make our robot learn hand-eye coordination as an infant does. And so I'm going to show you a video of an experiment where we do this. So what you're going to see here is the eye cub, and it's learning from as if it was as if it's just been born. And so it's going to learn how to control its body from the eyes down. And this is what we see in infants. We see what we call a cephalocaudal pattern of development. They learn from the eyes, through the head, down through the body, through the upper arms, lower arms, and down finally through the waist and the legs. And so what the ICUB is doing here is it's trying to learn under the action of those constraints, the constraints on the muscle tone that we've simulated on the robot. And over time, we gradually lift those constraints. So it's developing as if an infant would develop. Now, it may not look, for those of you familiar with infants, about the kind of actions that an infant would usually perform. But overall, the sequence of behavior there is the same. The learning how to control eyes, how to control the movements of the head, how to control the movement of the arm, and then down through the body. And what we see is by simulating these kind of constraints on the robot, it focuses learning in a sequence that makes it very easy for it to learn this task of hand-eye coordination. And it simplifies it so much that the robot here is able to learn hand-eye coordination in about an hour. And it's able to do it to the level that a five- or six-month-old infant might be able to achieve. And that is very fast, and it's very, very efficient. So by looking at how infants develop and the constraints on them from birth, we can find ways of tackling this first problem that I talked about, about how we distinguish what information is relevant and irrelevant. And the robot does this by using those constraints to cut out all the irrelevant information in learning. And so here it is after one hour of learning, being able to, having gone from a start where it knows absolutely nothing about how to coordinate its body, to being able to look to objects, move its body so they're within reach, and then reach out and touch them.
Now, this, this is quite good, but in our task of trying to get a robot to make tea, it's not particularly helpful, right? The robot still can't interact with objects. Five or six month old infants can't do a lot. They're not very useful. So what we need is for our robot to learn how to manipulate objects, how to handle them. And infants do this through play. And we see infants grasping objects. They'll shake them around. They'll bash them together. They'll put them in their mouths. And through all this activity, this play activity, they're learning about those objects and about how to interact with them. So we're building our robot so that it can play just like a child can. We also know from psychologists that when we're learning, we learn best at a level that's just beyond our current ability. If we try and continuously do a task over and over again, hundreds and hundreds of times, that we're very used to, we don't learn anything new. Equally, if we try and perform tasks and learn to do tasks that are far beyond our current level of ability, they're too complicated. We fail, and so we learn very, very little from that. So we maximize our ability to learn if we aim at tasks which are just beyond what we can currently do. And so we've built our robot to do this in this play behavior. What the robot will do is it will select what it finds the most interesting actions in its repertoire. These are usually the ones that it's learned most recently, and so the more complex ones, or actions that it's learned in the past which it thinks are particularly relevant to the situation it's in. And it will play with these actions and repeat them as long as it's learning. But as soon as it stops learning, that means that the action has become too simple. You know, it's learned enough about that. There's nothing more it can learn. Or perhaps it's the case that the action is too complex, and it's too difficult to learn about how that action is causing an effect in the environment. So I'm now going to show you our robot at play. Now, it starts off with the action that is most recently been learned, and that's the pointing action from the last experiment. And it repeats this action a number of times on this new object that it can see, because it's quite interesting. But it doesn't learn much from this, so it decides another action and it decides to grasp the object. Now, very infants, once they've got an object in their hand, they won't let go, and so our robot does the same. It hangs on to this object and tries some new actions, and it decides to start reaching around the environment. And suddenly it discovers that as it moves its hand, the object moves. This is new, this is completely new. So it tries it again, and again the object moves. And it repeats this time and time again, and discovers the object can be put in all these different positions. And then it eventually twigs that actually the object is moving with the hand. And so it could put it in any location that it can reach to. Now, after doing that, it, it's, it stops learning new things. And so it decides to go for another action. And this is very exciting. Look at this action. Did you see that? That's amazing. No? Not, not convinced? You might have seen my, my colleague Patricia's arm jump in just before the robot did that. And this is because it was completely unexpected. She's watching a computer screen, and she can see what the robot's about to do. And she sees this happen, and she dives in as if to stop the robot, because we're, we're not quite sure if it's safe. But what the robot has done is it's looked back through actions it's learned in previous experiments, and it's picked out this button-pressing action that it learned previously. And it's decided that that might be relevant in this situation. And so it's combined it with the action of holding this object to see whether it comes up with any kind of new response. But it doesn't. There was no buttons there. There was nothing for it to learn. So after performing the action, it stopped, and it went away and did something else. But through that sequence of play there, we've seen the robot going beyond what we'd initially programmed it to do at its core of being able to learn. And it's learned a whole set of new tasks just by playing with the environment. It's learned how to move objects around. And it's learned that some actions are too complex. It's learned that this button action, this button pressing action, is beyond the level of its current ability. And so it's stopped and gone on to do other things. And so this is solving that second challenge that I talked about. Now, if you'll forgive the pun, this work is still very much in its infancy. But we're seeing how robots, by modeling learning that we see in infants, and modeling the development, we can perhaps build robots that are capable of this kind of continuous learning. 
And in fact, we're now working with the robot. We're playing with it and interacting with it. And through those interactions and play, we're able to shape the learning and guide it to learn new things, just as you might with a child. Now, hopefully, this kind of work is leading to robotics where robots can go far beyond their initial programming, where they'll be able to continuously learn new skills and new abilities. And so hopefully that will enable them at some point to be able to learn so many different things and go far beyond their programming that they'll be able to adapt to all the kind of situations and scenarios that they might find themselves in as they're working alongside us as humans. And if they can do that, they'll be able to learn just like we can as humans. Thank you very much.